So once again I'm going to start out this documentary by looking at Chuck Penson's excellent book Heathkit Test Equipment Products which I think may be out of print now. I think Chuck said he did not plan to print anymore but there's still a lot of copies available. Um, one can buy them directly from Chuck uh, via his eBay store, I think. Um, and there's, you know, some ones floating around on Amazon and other places. Um, so we flip to the chapter on, let's see, analog VOMs, multimeters, and voltmeters. I've used this book so much that the binding is coming apart. It's a typical paperback type binding. And um, I've actually bought another copy of this to have on my shelf while I keep beating up this copy. Anyway, I've already done uh, videos on the majority of meters in this chapter. My most recent one was on the EK1, which was part of a um, children's basic electronics course. They would do a bunch of experiments and slowly build up the meter until they had a completed multimeter at the end of the course. I've already done the IM16. This is um, one of the FET multimeters. I've already done the IM17 portable FET multimeter. I'm not counting the IM20 from 1961 because that isn't a multimeter. I've already done the IM25, a large dual documentary on that. I've already covered the um, IM105, which is a version of a Weston meter. If I ever get my hands on an IM104, I'll do a video on that. And the 1104 is the same as the 104, just a later version of it. The 5217 is the same as the uh, the um, IM17, just a later version of it. And this is just a um, an accessory probe. I'm not looking at the dedicated uh, FET multimeters and so on at this point. And then finally we have the IM5284, which is uh, one of the lower priced ones at only $39.95 when it came out. But what I'm really trying to focus on at this point are these two older multimeters. I'll be doing the MM1 next from 1953, but the granddaddy of all Heathkit multimeters is the subject of this video, the M1. The VOM Handy Tester from 1949. This says it was based on the Simpson 240 Micro Tester, which sold for almost twice the price. And as I mentioned elsewhere in this video, uh, the word Simpsons, Simpson appears inside this meter, so um, it's not just based on Simpson at least part of it was built by Simpson. I'm sorry, Simpson called there's the micro tester, Heathkit called there's the handy tester. And uh, the ad copy from Heathkit says this meter features more or has more features than ever before, which is kind of odd because they didn't have an ever before. And in the same ad, an arrow with the word new pointed at the Ohm's Adjust Thumb Wheel, which seems to suggest that having an Ohm's Adjust Thumb Wheel is the new feature. But as far as I can tell from Chuck's book here, there was no earlier multimeter than the M1. And 1949 really goes back. So let's delve into the M1 Handy Tester. Okay, here's the artifact. Heathkit Precision. Kind of interesting that they put it on a meter with very low resolution. <laughs> it's all marketing. This is not really something you'd normally associate with precision. 
although in my previous tests it's actually pretty good um, as far as accuracy but it still doesn't have much resolution with a small meter and not even a mirror to help avoid parallax so let's see what we have here we have this fairly small meter here's just the size of my finger to show how small it is or hold up a pencil for scale we have a single AC scale and then we have three different DC scales ending with a 5, 10, or a 30 at full range and then you have to transpose the major divisions on the AC scale to the nearest major division on the DC scale. So for example if you're in the 30 volt AC range you would be looking first at the 30 volt scale for DC and of course that's going to match up with the full scale on the AC in red but if you're reading only for example uh, around this red mark here you have to think of that as representing 18 volts even though it's offset a little bit if you're reading around here that is really 12 volts not something less than 12 volts so you have to make those adjustments and I'm sure that that is uh, because it's always going to read a bit lower on AC due to the voltage drop of the rectifier not something you usually see with solid state multimeters because they usually use a precision rectifier op amp circuit which negates the um, voltage drop of the rectifier as if it wasn't there uh, but these analog ones don't have the advantage of that unless of course you add an FET front end to them then they're solid state volt ohm meters not just passive ones like this we have the screw for adjusting the meter to zero when there's no power applied there's the ohms adjust trim potentiometer it's a thumb wheel and we have one two three four one two three four ranges for AC and DC volts the uh, the one here is kinda I think the paints come off of it um, but there is a one there um, also the paint has come out of this little spot here I'm thinking of adding a little bit to it to spruce it up um, if you're gonna measure uh, 5000 volts then you've got this uh, terminal here and you would set it to the 1000 volt position but use this jack here instead of this position here you'd move the red lead over to here and then set it for 1000 but, but then it's going to read 5000 volts full scale and then the com always goes here we also have two milliamp ranges one for 10 milliamps full scale one for 100 milliamps full scale typical of things from this vintage especially Heathkit ones they were uh, they acted as if they didn't know the difference between milliamps and mega amps and things like that. They just used indiscriminately capital or lowercase m for things. That, by today's standards, it's almost inexcusable, but it was older times. And it was more of a convention than to, if you meant, um, like, uh, milliamps, for example you would use a capital M and then various things would be used for example microamps like they might use two M's for milli milliamps or something they had different ways of doing it now we have the uh, high and low ohms range and it actually says up here I forgot to mention that the top scale on the meter is for ohms and as usual it has zero at the far right and then infinity at the left and it even says on here for the high ohms range whatever is on the scale times 100 is the actual value 
and there's a little bit of um, writing way up under here which is really hard to make out some patent information and uh, does it say Simpson yeah it says Simpson Electric Chicago so this meter movement is made by Simpson and uh, that's about it as far as controls it is a multimeter measures AC and DC volts it only measures DC current and then the two ranges of ohms so pretty limited but still not a bad piece of kit the case is um, molded Bakelite and it's just a very simple case it does not have rubber feet it has molded bumps on the back of the Bakelite rear case half four recessed screws can be used to release the front which lifts right out and they do go into um, threaded brass inserts molded into the Bakelite so a mark of quality there and there's really nothing inside the rear of the case um, very simple all right let's look at the uh, the guts here so we have the back of the Simpson meter movement and since that uh, meter movement is so intrinsically tied into the front panel I wouldn't be surprised if Simpson made this whole front panel and probably the whole case for them because Simpson of course was making their own meters with very similar Bakelite cases so I wouldn't be surprised if Heath just sourced that all out to Simpson instead of just getting a movement from them and then using a Heath kit case uh, let's see so there's this aluminum bracket which is screwed through insulators uh, and brought out by wires and then because of the insulators this aluminum bracket's able to be held onto the meter terminals and that provides a way to hold the single C cell in place which is used for the excitation voltage in the ohms functions because it does not have a very high ohms function um, you don't need a higher voltage than 1.5 volts the selector switch um, there's three wafers or three layers and I'm not sure about the front one it looks like it has it as well certainly these back to have both front and rear sides to them so it comes out to be at least five maybe six layers of switch on this assembly and it is as you would expect surrounded by precision wire wound resistors not much else now way down in there is that gray item that's the um, the rectifier it's using three wires a red a yellow and a black that's kinda hard to make out there and uh, there's the trim pot there's a little metal bracket you can kinda see it there it's almost like a speed nut that slips over a molded protuberance on the Bakelite and then that holds the uh, aluminum bracket onto which the potentiometer for the ohms adjust is mounted and the other two resistors on here are large ones that are inside these two <laughs> I don't know what it is it's probably asbestos or something insulating heat, heat resistant uh, uh, tubes which comes from that 5,000 volt uh, range and it just uh, goes through one resistor and then uh, where they're joined together in series that's not insulated because it's tucked up next to all that Bakelite comes back up here bends around and goes to that terminal on the switch at which point it picks up the normal um, resistor attenuators 
So that's really about all there is to this. Um, pretty simple inside. There is one uh, thing about the rear of the case. It has this recess molded into it, which appears to be um, associated with the battery, clearance for the battery. It seems to be lined up with that. So apparently they found out that this was just a little bit too high to avoid uh, to hit this and maybe keep the case from closing 100% so they carved it out a little bit. Funny that it doesn't go all the way across because the battery is symmetrical. But uh, that's the way they did it. Uh, to make sure you put the case together correctly uh, I don't know if all of the examples of this had these red dots, but this one certainly does. A pair of the red dots, just small paint dots, uh, help you remember which side goes together front and rear. This meter did not come to me with test leads, so I've done what I usually do since it takes the old style banana plugs and I just buy a set of uh, Elenco TL4s from Amazon. Um, they're pretty cheap, but they work, and they do fit these old meters. Anyway, so I'm going to start out by connecting the meter up to my bench power supply with it selected to 10 volts DC. I have to adjust this light around a little bit so I don't get quite so much glare. Okay, and I'm going to turn my supply down to zero volts and turn it on. And we're going to watch the, the meter here. Remember, we're on the 10 volt scale, so it's the medium set of numbers there, the middle set of numbers. I'm going to go up to one volt, and it's right on the money. Remember that we're looking uh, there's zero and there's two so we're right in the middle it's one two have to take care of parallax here with the camera three four five six seven eight nine ten it's right on it's as accurate as I could expect it to be given the size of the meter now let's uh, switch down to the 30 volt range and um, so we're looking here and we go from 6 to 12 and that would be 7, 8, 9 yeah 10 is or 11 is there, 10 is about there so it's pretty good let's go to uh, 12 and it's right on 12 Let's go to 18. Getting adjusting for parallax there. It's right on 18. 24. It's right on 24. And let's go to 30, and it's right on 30. Switching to 300. Um, that makes this 60 and it's right in the middle so um, that's working well in DC volts okay I've switched it up to the 10 milliamp position the leads are still in the same place I have my power supply set to 24 volts and it's wired in series with my 4 to 20 milliamp uh, loop calibrator or tester and that's in series with the meter so I'll be able to vary the milliamps between 4 and 20 I'll switch it on I get a good loop indication and uh, with this being 10 milliamps here this is 4 milliamps and we're right on the money now I don't have it calibrated beyond that but I would expect that um, at 
a 10 reading here, we're about where I would expect it to be on the dial with 12 o'clock being 12 milliamps. So let's switch it over to the 100 milliamp range. So um, that would be 100 milliamps, that would be 20 milliamps, and adjusting for parallax, we're right between 0 and 2, so we're right on 10 milliamps. Now if I throw or if I turn this knob all the way up, we should be at 20 milliamps, and we are right on the money. So the milliamps is working in both ranges. Okay, I've moved uh, the old test leads out and I put my special test leads for my AC access panel into the meter in the usual positions. I've selected 10 volts AC and um, I'm going to turn my access panel on. It's plugged into my Variac. I'm going to turn it on to a 140 volt range and its meter is not very accurate but um, if I crank it up to about there it should be in the ballpark of 10 volts and it is let's see here so um, so 10 would be here and this meter always reads a little low here so let's just take an eyeball and gussy it up to about there yeah so that's looking pretty good let's uh, try uh, switching up to the 30 volt range 30 volts and we're going to about here which is about 10 um, we have to adjust for the red scale so that looks about right let's um, get out my fluke over here in AC volts mode I've adjusted the variac till I get just about 30 volts here on the fluke and um, that was just holding these test leads onto these and so it's uh, just reading ever so slightly low from the 30 volt mark on there. Let's switch her up to the 300 volt. I use the fluke to adjust the variac to 120 volts. It's right about where 120 is on the DC scale. That should be here. So it's reading just a tad high. But I'm going to double check that and make sure that I haven't uh, allowed this to drift. Okay, I it was a couple of volts high, I just bumped it down a bit. So it's reading ever so slightly high because this red mark here should be 120 volts. So small discrepancies, but doing pretty well. Okay, I have the meter selected to the low ohms position and it's connected up to my Heathkit decade resistance box and it's set to all zeros so it should be approximately zero ohms. Now I have to calibrate the meter by adjusting the thumb wheel ohms adjust here until I get full scale. That's pretty good. So uh, since I'm in low ohms now, this will be reading directly. So when it says 5, it'll be 5 ohms. When it says 10, it'll be 10 ohms. Let's uh, crank her up to 5 and it's right on the money. Let's take that back down and put it up to 10 on here and it's um, really close. Go to 20, 30, 40, 50, ever so slightly off but really good. And then we're reading the small tick marks on the nonlinear scale. So 60, 70, 80, 90, then I have to go back down on that range and go up to 100 here. And again, pretty much right on. At that point, we just run out of resolution. So I can go up to 500 ohms. And it's right on. Um, I can go to the 1K range and go up to 3K, which is the highest mark on here. And it's right on the money. So let's switch to the 
a high ohms mode, but first we have to um, bring everything back down to zero here. So I'm back to zero ohms and switch it to high ohms and it's going to be over scale so I have to adjust the trim pot here to bring it where it should be and I'll re... now everything's going to be times a hundred so when it says five it'll be five hundred <clears throat> let's go to five here and we're just about right on it let's go to 1k and is right about on 10. Uh, let's go to 10k. It's on 100 times 100 be 10k. And then once again, um, 200, 300, 400, 500. It's about as accurate as you could expect. But beyond that, it's only 50k and you're already pretty much maxing out the meter's ability to measure anything and it's already the resolution's way too low to be precise it just gets you in the rough ballpark so this meter is not good for measuring higher resistances I would say 50k is about the highest you can reasonably expect it to tell you The back is screwed back on, and there we have it. Let's take a quick look at the manual. This is a reproduction of the original Heathkit manual put out by manualman.com. And even though the product itself doesn't mention the model number anywhere I could see, it is the Handy Tester Model M1. As usual, it starts out with resistor and capacitor color codes, the specifications. Uh, full scale AC and DC ranges, the uh, ohm meter range, which says that it's good up to 30, 300k ohms well, not usably as I already demonstrated in, uh, in my demonstration that it, it can go up that high, but you're not going to read anything meaningful above about 50k. Uh, ranges in milliampers, uh, 0 to 10 mega amps, mega amps. <laughs> 0 to 10 milliamps and 0 to 100 milliamps. The uh, meter movement is a 400 microamp, 3 inch uh, window. AC rectifier is dual half wave. Accuracy is 1%. Divider and calibrating resistor provided. Meter of movement itself is 2% of full scale. Streamlined Bakelite case, and it uses one Burgess number one unicell flashlight battery. Um, maybe they didn't call them C cells at that time in history. There's a bit of a circuit description. The assembly, this is pretty early stuff here, so it doesn't have what we are accustomed to in the way of uh, assembly manuals. It's sort of perfunctory by comparison to what Heathkit's reputation later uh, established. So um, really no pictures. It's just connected up to here and there and so on. Final assembly, really perfunctory use. How to measure AC and DC voltage. Measure AC and DC voltage between 1,000 and 5,000 volts. It does establish plugging the black test lead into the comm jack, right into the 5,000 volt jack. Put the selector switch to the 1,000 volt AC or DC position as is appropriate. Uh, and then connect up the leads at the other ends and uh, observe the reading. Um, so that 
confirms what I was talking about earlier that the 5000 volt jack works for either AC or DC. How to measure resistance, how to measure DC current, talks about accuracy, and then already in, we're into in case of difficulty. <laughs> it's the shortest in case of difficulty I've ever seen on a Heath kit. One short paragraph. Recheck the wiring compared to the wiring diagram or the pictorial. Trace the wires. That's about it. Now there is a diagram here on the back. Very short parts list too. But it is a pretty simple thing and you know just having a page or two of text description and one picture is adequate to wire it up. Not the kind of thing that would be adequate for anything much more complicated. And then there's the schematic diagram and a couple more views of the assembled product. And then uh, I don't know if this is a manual man thing or if it was this way in the original manual. I suspect this is just a courtesy by manual man taking the smaller schematic on an earlier page and blowing it up to a larger size. Um, Anyhow, here's a look at the schematic. I've marked it up to uh, try to isolate the different circuits. So DC volts is in orange, AC volts is blue, DC milliamps is pink, ohms is green. The way the Heathkit schematic was drawn, and this is Typical of every Heathkit schematic I've ever seen that uses rotary switches, they aren't helping anybody by showing them the way they are. It's not easy to figure out. And these are worse because they don't make a correlation between the different wipers and how they interconnect. And also they uh, don't identify which positions are which, so you're left to search the circuit out to figure out which circuits are which, or which positions are which. Kind of the opposite of what should happen. Anyway, uh, I verified that all of this boils down to these simplified diagrams. Uh, so they didn't cheat here. They're not combining components or anything. So, uh, looking at DC volts, you've got the volt ohm milliamp terminal that would be the one that the positive lead, go, positive lead goes to and then the common lead down here it's not identified but it should be com <laughs> anyway so uh, it's straightforward matter of coming in here and going to the 10 and again it's not marked but the 30 the 300 and then the 1000 volt positions and you just have different values of resistor uh, all put in series with the meter movement and its shunt, which is a 417 ohm resistor. So um, some portion of the current goes through the resistor shunt, some goes through the meter movement itself. This just changes the sensitivity of the meter as necessary to work with all these other parts. Uh, in this case it does not act so much as a voltage divider. Uh, you can look at it that way but uh, it just essentially increases the series resistance so that uh, you get the correct current through here. Anyway, pretty straightforward. And then the 5000 volt terminal goes through two 2 meg resistors in series, which then adds to this point. You have to have the switch in the 1000 volt position to use these. So then you add all these other resistors in series. It looks to me like if you accidentally left the switch in some position other than 1000 and hooked up 5000 volts up here, you'd probably blow the meter up or damage it it'd probably bang it so hard to the right that it would sustain some damage. 
not a great way of doing this. Uh, but anyway, AC volts is exactly the same. It uses uh, the same circuit up until just this last little bit. But it does use different positions on the switch. And you can see here that, uh, let's see, these are the 1,000 volt positions, AC on this side, DC, then the uh, 300 volt positions here and here, the 30 volt positions here and here, and the uh, uh, 10 volt, yeah, 10 volt positions here and here. And they are connected back around, so the 10 volt positions are connected together, the 30s are connected together, the 300s are connected together, and then the two 1000s are connected together. So in this way, as far as this switch is concerned, it makes no difference whether you're in AC or DC. But these other gangs over here do play a role, and what they essentially do is bring in the rectifier and change the shunt resistor across the meter movement from 417 ohms that's used in DC to a 7000 ohm resistor that's used in AC and then the introduction of these two additional diodes for rectification. So on the positive half wave it goes through everything just the same as if it was DC and then goes through this diode and then either through the meter movement or the 7000 ohm resistor and then back out the common so some current's always going through the shunt, some's going through the meter. And then in the reverse uh, half of the uh, AC waveform, the current just bypasses the meter altogether, goes through this diode, back through the resistors, and out. So quite simple in that regard. For DC milliamps, <clears throat> the positive terminal goes directly to the meter movement and back out to the common and then it has one of two shunt resistors put across it either a 26 ohm or a 2.51 ohm resistor and that depends on whether you're in the 10 milliamp or the 100 milliamp range and then finally in the ohms range or the two ohms ranges the uh, resistor under test which I'll just sketch in there that's RX would be connected across there so the battery is trying to push current through this resistor and the meter movement with a variable shunt and this is the ohms adjust pot here and then back out and then returning through the resistor under test so depending on the resistor under test you get various amounts of current in this loop some of it flows directly through the meter movement some flows through the variable shunt and then in the low ohms mode then this additional shunt is put across this whole thing so it's a double shunt in the high position this shunt isn't there and you just have this part in series with the battery and the resistor under test so again very simple here is my little hand sketch redrawing the uh, original Heathkit schematic to make it a little easier to follow and to make the uh, rotary switches uh, just a little more obvious in their functionality. So I won't really go over this whole thing again, but it's a little more apparent this way that the 5000 volt range uses the same circuitry for AC and DC, that the like ranges in both AC and DC are just jumpered together on the switch, so there's no difference there and when you come out the bottom of the resistor attenuator in the DC ranges 
you go into this set of contacts on the next or the middle wafer of the switch but if you're on AC you come through this somewhat different resistance and go to these contacts which are also for the AC voltage ranges. Now from that point the common of this switch wafer goes to the plus side of the meter. Meanwhile the minus side of the meter is connected to the common jack and also to the common of the third wafer that's the lower wafer and in DC volts that has a 417 ohm resistor going around to this side which is on the plus side of the meter so essentially in DC volts we've put a 417 ohm resistor across the meter movement uh, a similar thing happens in the AC volts where we put a 7000 ohm resistor across the meter movement and we also add a rectifier so not only do we have a somewhat different resistor value coming out the bottom of the attenuator when we're in AC volts but we go through the half wave rectifier on the way to the plus side of the meter now for the other side of the AC waveform we come directly off of the common terminal and by way of the AC positions on the switch we can come back around and use this diode pointing in the other direction and then back through the resistor attenuator and out the positive terminal so that's how we get our rectification there um, in amps it's pretty simple we come in through the positive terminal that goes to the common of this wafer on the 10 milliamp range we go straight through to another equivalent position on the same switch and from there on to the plus side of the meter in 100 milliamps we go through a like position on the switch to the plus side of the meter the difference being that these two wires here each have their own shunt resistor back to the common terminal since we know that the uh, meter minus side is always tied to the common of the terminal it's pretty easy to see that one or the other of these shunts is placed across the meter uh, coil when you're in the uh, milliamp modes and that's all there is to the circuit for milliamps for ohms um, we are putting the 1.5 volt cell in series with a resistor here and the meter movement and then via the terminals here coming out the COM terminal the resistor under test and then back up here and via the switch we return to the minus side of the battery so we have the battery this fixed resistor the meter movement and the resistor under test in a series circuit and that is how we get the excitation from the battery to result in a meter movement that's associated with the overall resistance in the circuit now in addition to that there is this trim pot this is the ohms adjust and this changes the meter sensitivity only in these two positions of the switch which are the two ohms positions we have this pot connected to the common which is also the minus side of the meter and in these two positions we also connect the other side of the pot to the plus side of the meter so the ohms adjust pot acts like a shunt directly across the meter movement changing its sensitivity since it's a relatively high value this is 625 ohms and this is 20k uh, it has a relatively small amount of or a small effect on the current going through this meter but it does move it enough to adjust for changes in battery voltage 
Um, when you're in the low ohms mode, because the resistance external to the meter, the resistor under test, is so low uh, that you have a lot more current coming out of the battery and that would overwhelm the meter. So when we're in the low ohms position way over here, we add this additional low value resistor uh, essentially across the whole meter circuit, everything except the resistor under test. So even though we have a lot more current coming out of the battery due to the low value of the resistor under test, the majority of that current flows through this 29 ohm resistor bypassing the rest of the meter circuit and only one hundredth of the current flowing through the resistor under test actually goes through the meter circuit therefore it can work in its mode of uh, being one hundredth scale from the the higher range And I don't really want to beat a dead horse, but I think I'm going to illustrate this a little bit more. These are the equivalent circuits. Uh, when you're in DC volts, I've just got this set up as if it's in the 30 volt mode for purposes of illustration. In that case, the resistor attenuators uh, mount to only 20K plus 9750 ohms. There's a 470 ohm, a 417 ohm resistor in parallel with the 625 ohms of the meter movement. As I already mentioned, that's this resistor here. And that parallel uh, two resistors there equates the 250 ohms. So we really have 250 ohms in series with 9750 ohms, which makes one, uh, 10,000 ohms, or 10K. That plus this makes 30K. And then you apply the 30 volts if you're giving it a full scale voltage in the 30 volt mode, or 30 volt range. So 30 volts divided by 30K is one milliamp flowing through this. If we still treat these two resistors together, as being 250 ohms, 1 milliamp flowing through 250 ohms gives you 0.25 volts across these two resistors. Since we know we have 0.25 volts full scale across this resistor and we know its resistance, we can do the math and calculate that that gives us 400 microamps through the meter movement. And that of course is what gives this meter full scale because it's a 400 microamp meter movement. So it'll read full scale when you put 30 volts on the meter in the 30 volt range. The circuit's almost identical for AC volts. The resistor here is a little bit different than this one and that's probably got something to do with compensating for the effect of the rectifier. This sketch illustrates the rectifier a little more. This is the meter movement. This is the resistor across it. Notice that it's 7,000 ohms instead of 417 ohms. And that 7,000 is this resistor here from this uh, full schematic. So again, this resistor here in parallel with this affects its overall sensitivity. So the sensitivity is clearly a bit different than it is when you're in the uh, DC volts um, function. But all of that adds up. I didn't do the math here partially because I don't know for a fact what the voltage drop on these uh, diodes in the rectifier are. But um, just, you know, a back of a napkin quickie calculation shows that you know, it should be approximately right. And then, of course, when you've got the reverse current, you don't want to have reverse current applied to the meter down here. So, in the reverse side of the, um, well, number one, nothing would go through the meter anyway because there's this diode pointing this direction. But to give the reverse uh, current a path 
we give it through this diode and it still flows through these resistors the milliamps mode is the simplest one and the way I've got it drawn here is for the 10 milliamp mode here we have the 625 ohm meter in parallel with a shunt which is a 26 ohm resistor now assuming a full scale current of 100 milliamps is put through the meter from whatever external circuit it's connected to 26 ohms in parallel with 625 ohms comes to 25 ohms so this whole thing looks like a 25 ohm resistor matter of fact I'm gonna sketch that in right now there we go so these two resistors in parallel add up to 25 ohms 10 milliamps through a 25 ohm overall resistance gives us a voltage drop across those resistances of 0.25 volts and since we know there's 2.25 volts across this resistor, the meter uh, doing Ohm's law on it tells us that we're going to get 400 microamps through the meter, hence a full scale reading um, when you apply 10 milliamps through the meter circuit while you're in the 10 milliamp mode. The only thing that changes is when we're in the 100 milliamp mode, we substitute a much lower resistance of 2.51 ohms so even more current goes through the shunt and less goes through the meter but because it's 10 times as much current coming from the outside world it still results in 400 microamps through the meter movement giving a full scale reading when you're putting 100 milliamps through in 100 milliamp range as is almost always the case with uh, multimeters the ohms mode is the uh, most complex this is um, essentially what's there. You've got the 1.5 volt battery, and it's in series with the 200 or 2516 ohm, 2516 ohm resistor that's always there. And then we have the meter movement, 625 ohms, and it's paralleled by the 20k ohms adjust trim pot, and then it continues down with the resistor under test which is of course external to the meter and then back to the battery so the way these calculations are usually done is you assume that Rx is 0 ohms because we know that's going to result in a full scale reading so it keeps the math a bit simpler uh, these two resistors in parallel I, I work this out by reversing the, the algebra and figure that the trim pot must be set to approximately 2577 ohms to properly zero the meter and that in parallel with the 625 results in a 503 ohm parallel combination so assuming the high range of the meter high ohms range and assuming that Rx is zero ohms and assuming that the ohms adjust pot is set to the 2577 ohms like I mentioned that all adds up to um, or in parallel with the 503 ohms of this circuit the total series resistance is 3019 ohms the 1.5 volts from the battery one, yeah, the 1.5 volts from the battery divided by that 3,019 ohms gives 497 microamps. Uh, 470 microamps times the 503 ohms here gives a 0.25 volt voltage drop across these two resistors. And since we know we have 0.25 volts across this meter resistance with its 625 ohms we know that gives us 400 microamps which of course is a full scale reading and when in the ohms mode a full scale reading is 0 ohms which is of course what we would have if Rx is equal to 0 so that's all well and good for the full scale reading let's assume that instead of 0 ohms Rx is 
3,100 ohms or 3.1K. That makes the total resistance 6,119 ohms, making the main current uh, 245 microamps. 245 microamps across the parallel combination of resistors up here gives uh, 0.123 volts developed across the meter. And that voltage divided by the resistance of the meter, 625 ohms, gives 197 microamps through the meter, which is just a hair under 200 microamps, which would be half of 400 microamps, which is the full scale uh, current of the meter. So we know the meter is going to be pointing pretty much straight up when we give it 197 microamps. Um, if we look at the scale of the, or the ohm scale of the meter, 31 is approximately the number you get when the meter is pointing straight up. So um, when we're in the high ohms mode as we have been in this description, you have to take whatever the meter is pointing at, 31, multiply it by 100 and you get 3100 ohms or 3.1K which is what we said we were using hypothetically to analyze this circuit, so that makes sense. Now the only other thing that happens is when you're in the low ohms mode, because Rx is such a low value now, you're going to have a lot more current coming out of the battery when you're in the low ohms mode. So in the low range, the 20 a 29 ohm shunt resistor is connected across all the resistances of the circuit except for Rx. So in other words, we have a 29 ohm shunt resistor from here to here. So it shunts all of these resistors. 29 is of a ratio with the meter circuit resistance such that one hundredth of the overall current goes through the meter circuit while 99 hundredths of the current goes through the shunt resistor. In other words, 99% of the current goes through the shunt and 1% goes through these resistors. Since the whole low uh, ohms scale of the ohm meter is one hundredth of what it would be in the high ohms range that makes sense because now this circuit sees exactly what it would if you were in the high amps or the high ohms range um, because we're shunting most of the current around it. So that's how that works.